How's it going guys? And boy do I have a special video for you guys today. We are going to be building a gaming computer from scratch. A gaming slash editing computer. And this is going to be great fun. I wanted to do this on the channel for a very long time and it's going to be great fun. So I have my computer back here that I use for recording all of the gameplay videos and editing everything. It's all on here. However, I am going to be making a CPU upgrade. However, when you upgrade your CPU, your central processing unit, normally you've got to buy a lot of other stuff as well. So I'm basically going to be doing a guide from scratch on how to build a PC because it will include kind of removing and replacing most of the parts in the computer. So what have we actually got in the computer already? Right now there is an LGA 1155 Sandy Bridge Intel CPU in there. That is an i7 CPU. It is the 2600K model, I believe, clocked at, I think, 3 gigahertz, maybe 3.7 gigahertz. It's actually not overclocked, there is just a standard clock on that CPU. And we are actually going to make the change from Intel to AMD. We are going to the Ryzen platform of CPUs. And the reason I've done that is because, one, primarily, budget is tight. Budget is tight and these AMD Ryzens are extremely affordable in comparison to their Intel counterparts. Also, this is a completely unlocked AMD CPU, which means it can be overclocked and it has 8 cores for the same price as an Intel i7 7700K processor which is actually only 4 cores and more expensive. Not only that, but the motherboard you need for it as well is also more expensive. So therefore, for the sake of budget and also for the sake of that, for me, a video editor, more cores would be much more beneficial than say a 4.5 gigahertz clock, even though you can get that with overclocking on this. This is the AMD Ryzen 7 1700 model. You can also get the 1700X and also the 1800X, which are basically the same. However, they require a bit more power and they come with a better clock out of the box. However, you can get the same amount of clock speed as the what, 1700X on this one, the 1700, and it actually comes with a cooler as well. And I don't actually have any AMD coolers because I've been on the Intel side, I've been on the blue team. So, Really good idea to go ahead and go with this one for value for money. Not only that, but also the AM4 socket by AMD is also going to support it for a very long time. So, Ryzen 7 CPU, 1700. Fantastic deal right there, hopefully. Not only that, but we are going to be reinstalling my Elgato Gaming Capture HD Pro. I've actually used this before in the past, however, because of various complications with the motherboard that is currently in this one, I actually can't use it anymore. But now we've got a brand new motherboard. We can go ahead and throw this one in there. And we have also got an 8 gigabyte kit of Corsair Dominator Platinum RAM. This is clocked at 3000 megahertz. And a lot of you guys may be saying, why have you only gone for 8 gigabytes? You know, surely you said yourself, a video editor, 16 would be ideal, right? In fact, you should probably just have 16 anyway, even if you're not a video editor for the sake of future proofing. Well, that's true. However, I don't know if you guys have noticed, DDR4 RAM is actually really expensive at the minute. Really expensive. Uh, it's probably something like maybe an extra two-thirds of price is what its older DDR3 counterpart was. And I've heard there's a bit of a copper shortage and stuff, so maybe that's why. And also lots of people are starting to upgrade to DDR4 about this time. So, therefore, this one, nice idea to go ahead and get the 8 because it means I can save a little bit of money and probably get the other 8 I need next month after payday and stuff like that. So... 8 gig for now, and after that we will go ahead and go and add another 8 gig in the future. And this is actually a very old component right here. This is a GeForce GTX 970 graphics card by Gigabyte. And the only reason I'm showing this is because I get an awful lot of people asking what graphics card do I have. This is a 4 gigabyte graphics card, and not only that, but it is actually a mini one. So it can actually fit into most mini ITX boards as well. So. That's actually really nice, you know, and it still has all the same power as a regular 970. I probably could have got a full length 970 for cheaper, but the fact that this is much smaller and requires much less power was a nice idea, I thought, you know, go ahead and get the mini one. But as I said, that's old, that's just for you guys to know in the future. And now finally, this arrived this morning, this is the last thing I was waiting for. This is an MSI X370 motherboard, which has the AM4 socket for, of course, the Ryzen 7 chipset. And there's a few ones you can pick to go ahead and get the AM4 socket. And I went with the X370, which is kind of the most advanced chipset you can get for a Ryzen 7. And you don't have to do this one, of course. You can get B350 AM4 socket motherboards. And they are maybe, maybe, I don't know, two-thirds the price as one of these. 
But the reason I went with this one, the slightly more expensive one, is one, this one actually happened to be on offer on Amazon, so I actually got it for like £70 off, so great deal right there. But also, I probably will end up overclocking this in the future. Maybe not with the default fan which it comes with. This one actually does come with a stock cooler because AMD are nice like that. But this one... I think with some better cooling, you can get better overclocks out of it. It's got a few more settings in the BIOS, and also it's kind of got more stable power lanes and stuff like that. It's also got shielded M.2 slots in there, so you can go ahead and get a shielded M.2 drive in there. Another thing to take into account is that the B350 motherboards cannot use SLI. I don't know if they can use Crossfire, but I believe they can't use NVIDIA SLI, meaning linking two graphics cards together. I've only got one right now. But I might end up with two graphics cards later in the future. I don't know. So, it would be really nice to go ahead and have one that's a little bit future-proof. So I went ahead and had this one. Plus also, it's MSI. It's a brand I trust. And it actually looks nice and has some of that fantastic RGB lighting that everyone has been so raving about since 2017. And it's all going to be going inside this Cooler Master chassis. I've had this case for a very long time now. I believe they came out in 2009 and I've had it since... 2011 maybe, so therefore it was pretty old over time when I bought it. And it served me very well, there's been no problems. However, there are some things which it doesn't have that more enthusiast cases normally have, such as holes for cable management and also removable drive bays. However, they actually did make a Scout 2, Cooler Master did, which does have all of those features. So if you want to get a case that's similar to this, then you can go ahead and do that with the Scout 2. But obviously I've never actually used one, so I don't know how modern they are. It's also got things like carrying handles and stuff like that and toolless drive bays. So it's got some great things, but it's just a little bit outdated. So, with that all said, let's build a PC. It's going to be great fun. Building a PC is one of those fun things you can do, one of those relaxing, rewarding things you can do. And it's going to be great fun. Never had an AMD chipset before, so let's give it a go. So to start off with building your brand new PC, you will need a few tools to get started. You will need a Phillips head cross screwdriver, the longer the better, maybe a can of compressed air and a paintbrush to remove dust, along with an anti-static wrist or ankle strap. You don't necessarily need it, but it helps keep your electronics safe from static electricity. So if we look inside the current computer, you can see a very bizarre mix, a cornucopia of new and old technology. We've got like a nice Cooler Master heatsink on there, we've got a 970 graphics card, but we've also got an absolutely ancient LGA1155 motherboard in there, along with some regular old hard disks. And the thing about the motherboard is that I actually had to replace it last year, and finding stuff for LGA1155 CPUs is actually very hard. It didn't last long, the chipset, so I could only get this motherboard, and it's an absolute nightmare. You need to remove the heatsink in order to remove the CPU power connector. It's really poorly designed. Not only that, but if you have a graphics card in there, you actually can't get to your PCIe expansion slot because it was just very badly designed. But anyways, despite bad mouth from it, I'm going to keep all of the hardware because all I need is a power supply, a hard drive, and a case, and then I've actually got a second computer right there. And not a bad one, it's still an i7 processor after all, so I'll definitely keep that. And here I am removing the 700 watt Evo Labs power supply. This is a hybrid power supply, meaning it is not fully modular, but semi-modular. And it has served me perfectly well for years, absolutely no problems with it. There's room for expansion and it's been great for power consumption as well. I'm also able to remove the hard disks using the toolless drive bays in this case, so I can give them a proper clean with the brush. And here I am using the compressed air to clean all of the dust inside here, for which there is a lot. Use the compressed air to kind of give it a good blow, and then use the brush to beat the devil out of it, just like Bob Ross. And the thing about using the brush is that it gets into all those kind of hard to reach areas, but gets rid of a lot of the dust. Do not use a vacuum cleaner, as many people say, that can build up static, so don't do that. Just use the compressed air and the brush and you will be fine. Um, since I've actually removed all of the components from my case, I'm actually able to go ahead and use the brush to get rid of some of the dust in the normally hard to get areas, such as actually in the fans. Because when you actually have components in there, you don't really want to take things apart too often, just in case you break something accidentally. But since there's nothing in there, I'm able to go ahead and remove all the fans, get rid of all the dust, and there was a huge amount in there. And normally I'd clean it every few weeks or so, so it's actually nice to know that it's actually been done very thoroughly this time. And once the dust has settled, we will actually start assembling the rest of the computer. So now that the case is prepped and ready to go for later, we need to build the computer outside the case just to ensure that all the components work. Build it on the cardboard box it came with to ensure you're safe from static. We want to remove this plastic bracket here. This is so that you can use older AMD fans if you want to, but I actually have a new one. 
lift up the retention arm on the motherboard and then grab your CPU. But obviously, do not touch the pins on this CPU, this is what makes contact with the motherboard, and line up the little orange triangle with the white dot on the socket. It will only go in one way, if you put it in the wrong way, it will break. And then just drop it in. Don't push it, don't slide it in, just drop it directly over the top of it, and close the retention arm. Boom! Scariest part is now done. People will make it seem really scary, but it's actually not that scary at all, just follow it precisely. And then grab your Rave Spire cooler, which came with my CPU. It actually has thermal paste pre-applied, so I just need to pop it on top of the CPU and then screw it on the top. That's something quite nice that this has that the Intel fans don't have. You screw them onto the motherboard, which is actually really nice. Once it's screwed on, connect it to the CPU fan connector, and boom, CPU installed. Scariest part, all done. And now it is time to install the memory, the RAM. What you want to do is line up the notch onto the notch on one of these DIMM slots and then open the little retention arms on the side and then with even pressure on both sides, push it down. RAM is actually probably the easiest thing on your computer to install and if you only have two sticks, install it into the second and fourth slot. That ensures the most amount of memory is used efficiently because there are different slot configurations. Now it is time to plug in the graphics card, very similar to the RAM, open up the retention arm and then slide it into there with the notches all lined up. Again, very simple to put that in there. And now we need to connect the motherboard to the power supply by using the 24 pin ATX cable. Shove that onto the motherboard and also the same for the eight pin CPU power. This will power the CPU. And then once that is done, we need to connect the SATA cable to one of the SATA ports on the motherboard. This is to transmit the data from our hard drive, which has windows on it, to the motherboard and also plug in the hard drive to our power supply as well. And then once they are all in, with the motherboard plugged in, the CPU plugged in, the graphics card plugged in, and the hard drive plugged in, we can short the power connectors using a screwdriver on the motherboard, just to see if it posts. Boom, we have stuff on screen, all of the hardware works. Fantastic stuff, right? And now, turning back to the case, we need to install our IO shield. Please, install this now. If you forget to install this now, you will have to remove everything in order to put it back in. Please remember to do it now. We've all done it at least once, and it's annoying. And now we need to install our motherboard into the case. In order to do this, we need to line up the screw holes with the brass motherboard standoffs that are in the case, and line up all of the connections into the I.O. shield. You can't actually screw your motherboard directly to the case. If you do that, it will cause an electrical short and the computer will never allow you to turn it on. It will always automatically turn itself off to stop you from frying your own hardware. So screw it to the standoffs. And now we need to actually go ahead and attach the USB connections. These are the connections which are actually at the front of your case. And we need to go ahead and put them into the USB ports at the bottom of the motherboard, along with the audio connections. If you're unsure about where they go, check your manual. It will always have diagrams telling you exactly where to go. And now we have the most annoying part of every computer build, the front panel connections. These are tiny little single pin sockets, maybe about two millimeters wide, that we had to plug in using this diagram which is inside the manual. And if we don't put them in the right way, then the buttons won't work. The little arrow aboard the switches tells you which is positive and the G means for negative, the ground. And then we need to very fiddly and with much concentration, plug them in. But once they're in, they're done, you don't have to worry about it, but it's very, very fiddly work and you need very delicate hands in order to do it. And now we're actually going to connect up the RGB extension cable from the fan to the front of the motherboard. I've never actually used RGB before. Line up the two arrows on the extension and then attach it to the appropriate socket on the motherboard as displayed in the manual. Then we're going to go ahead and put our brand new cleaned hard drives inside the tallest drive bays aboard the case so that we can actually slide them in and remove them whenever we want to. And they're in there now and we can connect up these SATA port cables. And the SATA cables can come with straight or right angles, doesn't matter which one you use, just comes down to personal preference. And also we need to connect up the power supply cables, the SATA power supplies. And this will plug directly into the power supply unit, the PSU. And once that is ready, we need to attach the SATA cables to the motherboard and then reattach our 24 pin cable to the motherboard. But we're actually going to be using an extension here to go around to the back so it keeps things neat and tidy. And now we need to slot our power supply back in, being careful not to damage the cables which are connected to the motherboard through the grommets at the bottom and then screw the power supply back in. Once that's in, it's in there for good now until we unscrew it. It's not going to move, it's going to be solid. 
Then we need to put all of our cables through the little holes at the bottom in order to ensure ample airflow. And then once we've got everything pushed through, we need to connect up the power supplies for the hard drives and also for any fans, any extra optical discs and also the graphics card into the power supply. And then reconnect our extensions around the back of the case. This is actually the back of the case now and you can see a huge mass of wires. But don't worry, we will be cleaning that up. And now that that's all connected and everything is powered on, well not powered on, but plugged into the power supply, shove your graphics card back in and using the 8 pin connection, throw that back on there, but some graphics card only needs 6, some need 12. So make sure you actually plug in the correct one. And then once that is plugged in and ready to go, we can look at the front. Looks pretty nice, doesn't it? But of course, if we actually go to the back, it is a nightmare. Time for cable management. Use some cable ties and maybe even some Velcro cable ties to ensure everything is neat and as flat and as tidy as possible. This ensures good airflow and keeps everything cool, as well as makes things easier for you to find later on. But at the front of the case, I only use Velcro straps because it just looks much, much neater in my opinion. And then, once that is done, you can look at your lovely PC with pride and be happy with it. Looks pretty nice, we've got the Elgato in there, we've got our graphics card in there, we've got our RAM, we've got our CPU in there, we've got our hard drives connected, we've got the motherboard in there, we've got all the RGB connected, and everything looks great. And now, plug in a monitor, a mouse, and a keyboard, and power it on. It posts! Well done guys, well done. Well, there was a very quick crash course on building a computer, people. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you're new, I hope you learned something. And if you've already built a computer before, I hope you just enjoyed watching it because it is fun building computers, isn't it? It really is. And I'm sure a lot of you are wondering, what about the actual CPU? What's the difference like? It's actually pretty good, actually. Like, I've been editing this video to see what the actual kind of difference is like because 8-core CPUs are not necessarily better at things like games, for example, but they are better at things like video exporting and video rendering, stuff like that, 3D modeling, things which involve lots of hyper-threaded performance. And for that purpose, it actually does work very, very well indeed. I have done some of the kind of tidying up with it that you need to do when you first get Ryzen, a new power plan for Windows in order to ensure it is maximally used. I actually went ahead and overclocked it to 3.8 on the original fan. I actually probably could push it a bit more. However, under load, I am getting like 68, maybe. If it's on a 100% fully synthetic load, it gets to about 68. However, doing normal tasks like video editing and gaming, it's normally around like 48, 45. So it's actually pretty good temperatures using that default cooling solution. So if you actually went ahead and got like a much more effective cooler solution, an aftermarket one, you could probably go over four gigahertz, or at least with my one. Anyway, Silicon lock Lottery was lucky to me, I guess. But um, yeah, you definitely got to make sure you update the BIOS and stuff as well, because if you don't do that, the BIOS only recognizes, I believe it's 2,666 megahertz of your RAM, and I obviously have 3,000, and faster RAM with Ryzen really does make a big difference. When you put that up to three, it actually does make it much faster than what it was only on 2,666 megahertz. Uh, the RAM is good. I do need more, though. I've been editing this pro video here, and I've noticed I really do need more RAM. It would speed it up a lot. So I definitely think next month I will probably have to go ahead and get the other 8 gigabyte of RAM that I previously want. So I'll be up to 16, which will make it much faster. Just opening things like Premiere Pro and stuff did cause a little bit of slowdown. So that's a shame. But besides that, it's pretty darn good. I do like it, and it's great value for money. So... If you enjoy watching this video, please make sure you like and leave a subscribe. Remember to check out all the cool Patreon people in the description below, and I'll see you in the next video. I don't know what I'll do yet, and I'll see you around. This has been the final render, and you've been the audience. Until next time, farewell. And then, of course, a few days later, the acoustic foam arrived. Acoustic foam is something which I've wanted in this setup for a long time because it just looks so good. It's got little divots and little crevices in there made out of foam and then it means any kind of audio gets trapped inside those crevices and eventually gets absorbed into the foam.